Okay, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Healthy Brain Research Network Scholar Webinar and Panel Presentation on Professional Development. My name is Edline Francois, and I am a Healthy Brain Research Network Scholar with OHSU. I'll be moderating today's uh, session. The Healthy Brain Research Network, or HBURN, was created by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in 2014 to address a growing pair of public health challenges, promoting cognitive health and addressing the needs of increasing numbers of older African American, older Americans, sorry, living with cognitive impairment, building public health workforce capacity, and the H. Burns Scholar Program is part of delivering on the broader mission of the Healthy Brain Research Network. For today's session, we could look forward to hearing from Dr. Jeff Harris, Chair and Professor in the Department of Health Services within the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. He will be presenting on time management and strategies. Dr. Heather Brandt, she's the Associate Dean in the Graduate School and Professor in, the, in Health Promotion, Education and Behavior at the Arnold School of Public Health, University of South Carolina. She will be presenting on the strategies for giving awesome scientific presentations. And Dr. Jane Moeller is a professor of medicine with co-appointments in public health and bioengineering. She is also co-principal investigator and director of the Healthy Brain Research Network Center at the University of Arizona. She will be presenting on mentoring matters. During the webinar, participants are encouraged to enter questions or comments in the chat box and direct those to everyone. The chat box can be selected from the toolbar by hovering at the bottom of your screen, the bottom or the top of your screen. We have allotted approximately 20 minutes to respond to as many questions or comments as feasible at the end of the three presentations. This webinar is being recorded Links to the webinar and recording and related participant materials and handouts will be distributed to all registrants. We also invite you to complete our post-webinar survey. So Dr. Jeff Harris, he will be starting us off today. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Thanks, Thanks very much, Evelyn. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about time management. I'm going to share a few things that have worked for me, for me, and hopefully they will work for you. I first came across this concept of time management when I moved to CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, after I finished my uh, residency in internal medicine. And there was a guy named Alan Lakin who had published a book called Take Control of Your Time in Your Life, and people were talking about it. And um, he was an efficiency expert, and he talked about things like um, not buying a newspaper, but reading the headlines as you walk by the stand, and uh, not washing dishes, instead using uh, paper plates, because it was much more efficient to use paper plates than to wash your dishes. And I thought, gosh, you know, there must be more to this than that. And there is. And I'm trying to shift slides here. Yeah, there it's going. Um, so it, the three things I want to talk with you about are uh, time management is really about setting priorities. You know, what, what do you want to do? Where are you trying to go? Um, it's much more important to figure out where you want to go than it is to figure out how to get there efficiently. Um, and then planning your time to accomplish those priorities and then managing your time to implement that plan. So what I'm going to do is go through eight... Uh, sort of aphorisms, if you will, that I've drawn from reading uh, a bunch of books about this. And I've given you uh, a list of those books and some of the key takeaways that are in the handout that was sent out. And hope that's useful to you. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty quick read. So I'll go through eight aphorisms, if you will, and, and uh, tell you how I use them and why. So, you know, I think the first step in setting priorities is, uh, is figuring out what your major roles are in your current life. It's, it's pretty hard to say, 
gosh, what are, what are my priorities? Or at least it's easier to say that if you kind of put things into buckets. And Stephen Covey and Merrill and Merrill uh, wrote about this in First Things First, uh, which is listed at the bottom of the slide. And uh, they recommend that you have up to seven major roles and that one of those always be what they call sharpening the saw, so sort of maintaining your mind and your body and improving to move forward. Um, but for me, let's give you a couple of examples of those. One would be that I'm the chair of the department. So that's clearly a major role for me uh, in my professional life. And then in my home life, um, you know, I spend a fair bit of time sort of trying to help manage things around the house along with my wife and my son. And so th that's another major role for me, just to give you examples of what those major roles are. And I have seven. And I will say, it took me a long time to figure out these roles. I kind of I wrote them down and used them and then they weren't quite right. So if you, if you do take this on, don't think you're gonna necessarily get it right the first time. Um, a second one, it sounds sort of businessy. It comes from Making Work Work by Julie Morgenstern and it's, it's dance close to the revenue line. But for those of us who are in academics, that really translates to, you know, what's gonna have payoff uh, in my career and in moving my priorities forward. So, um, you know, as an academic, I, uh, I, need, I need to develop grants on the things that I want to make a difference in in the public's health. And uh, so dancing close to the revenue line means I'm working on grants. Uh, in order to get grants, I also uh, to get promoted. I need to uh, publish my work. And also I want to tell people about my work. So those are examples of, of the kinds of uh, things that you might want to prioritize at the front of the line, things like publications and grants to quote unquote dance close to the revenue line. So as we move on now to the second uh, one of those things, planning, uh, Stephen Covey and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is one of the more useful books I've read in my life actually. Uh, and it's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie. He talks about planning for five years, which is the kind of a longer horizon to set your goals. You know, where do you want to, what are the big picture, what's the big picture view of what I'm trying to do with my life, uh, both professionally and personally. And then six months, uh, set objectives. So within those goals, what are the things that I uh, want to get done over the course of six months to a year? I pick six months because the year just seems too long, but five years is certainly too long. And then within those six months for each of the items you say, and say, let's say you have 10 objectives over the next six months, what are the activities that you're gonna carry out this week? And a week is, the, is kind of the right amount of time. It, it, uh, it's a horizon you can actually deal with. Uh, you, know, you have a weekend in the middle um, and it's better than doing it daily just because uh, you could spend all your time planning and no time getting things done. So five year goals, six month objectives, and one week activities. Uh, then as you're planning, uh, it's also reasonable to think about doing first things first. And this is also from the seven habits. And so first things first means really, you know, what are, the th what are my highest priorities? And those are the things I'm gonna do first today. And uh, certainly as you're thinking about that, I would urge you to uh, realize that email is probably not your highest priority. Uh, email is something, you know, we all need to, to keep up with at some level, but, but if, you're, if you're working on a grant or you're working on a paper and those are your highest priority, make sure you do those first before you dip into email. And if you're like me, not only dip into email, but get lost in it. Uh, and another thing that has really been helpful to me in planning and uh, is beginning with the end in mind. So if I'm writing a scientific paper, as you know, different journals have different styles. There's one journal that I like a lot, uh, submit a lot of papers to called the American Journal of Health Promotion. They're the only journal I know that has a so what section. And so if I'm gonna submit to them, I better plan on writing a so what section. And you know, different journals have different names for sections and they also have different styles for references. And it can just save you a lot of time if you figure out where you're trying to send a paper from the beginning and write it with that style in mind and those requirements in mind. And you know, uh, the, the paper is sort of a metaphor for lots of things, but everything you do, it really, you'll be much more efficient and effective if you um, figure out where you're gonna go before you actually start on the journey. 
Next would be uh, Don't Be the Bottleneck. And this is a paper I read in business school. It's called, a book I read in the business school called The Goal by Eliyahu Goldratt. And, you know, a bottleneck is, um, it's, as, you, as you think about projects, it's important to think about them as systems, if you will, and think about where the bottlenecks are. So an easy example of a bottleneck, if you're someone who cooks, I cook quite a bit, is turning on the oven. Uh, if you're preparing something that's going to need to go in the oven, um, and if you wait until you've got it prepared until to turn on the oven, then it adds 20 minutes to your time to finish cooking, if you will. So it's uh, often smart to avoid that bottleneck by turning on the oven first and then preparing it, and then you're ready to go. But my admonition here is to not be the bottleneck. Um, so if you're working with a team, hopefully you're working on things that are projects that are high priority for you with the team, don't be the person in the team that's slowing things down. Don't be that. So I often will put others' work before I put mine. I you know, wouldn't say that should be all that you do, but I look for way, places where I could be the bottleneck slowing everybody else down, and I'll get that done before I get my work done just so I'm moving the team's project along. You don't want to be that, that boss or that mentor who holds things up for two months or, or even worse, six months, and I see it all the time. I don't want to be that. Uh, another uh, another uh, aphorism that comes from both Getting Things Done by David Allen and How to Write a Lot by Paul Silva is um, break complex tasks down into action steps and do a little every day. So if I'm working on a grant, uh, then, you know, the first thing would be perhaps to do the literature review and uh, and you know, the next thing might be to write the specific aims. And so at least a first draft of the specific aims. So I can get started on those things. I mean, if I just say, I'm gonna write a grant, you know, which can often be several hundred pages long, it just is overwhelming. Whereas if I break it down into action steps and do a little bit every day, then it, it tends to get done more quickly. Um, and, you know, I don't, there's no magic number, but for me, uh, sort of the, the least amount of time I'll try to work on something is 30 minutes and, and probably the most is an hour because I've usually got a lot of things I'm working on in a day. So, you know, pick off that 30 minutes. Don't wait for the perfect day to get started because it never comes. Don't wait for the day when you have four hours to work on something because it never comes. So just do something a little bit every day. The other advantage of this is if you start on a big project, spend half an hour on it, your subconscious will continue to work on it even though after you've stopped and it'll work on it while you're sleeping. And the next day you'll have insights that you didn't have the day before. You may even start all over, but you'll start all over in a better direction. Thank you, Dr. Harris, but we need to wrap up in about 30 seconds. And we are about to. So the last thing is to finish yesterday's email before you begin today's. Uh, and this has helped me immensely. The idea here is that there's no end to email. The day you die, there will still be lots of email. And I, if you can finish yesterday's email and really get, and get that done every day, you'll never be that person who has, who's 300 emails behind or 3,000 emails behind. So thanks a lot. It's, uh, time management is about setting priorities and then planning and then implementing your plan. Perfect segue from time management. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that. Um, and now we welcome Dr. Heather Brandt. Thank you, everyone. I'm very excited to um, join you today for this uh, webinar, and I'm pleased to also follow the presentation on time management because you certainly can get lost spending significant amounts of time uh, preparing for presentations. Uh, so today I'm going to review a few tips and strategies for giving awesome scientific presentations. Sorry, I'm trying to move it forward. I'm not sure why it's not going. There it goes. The delay. Thank you. You told me about the delay. All right. So one of my favorite and recently acquired quotes about presentations is the best presentations start conversations. Isn't that why we submit abstracts? Isn't that why we give talks, why we present posters and more? I think it is. And I think we hope to start a conversation with someone, anyone who's interested in our work. 
we want to use these opportunities to build and extend our professional network and get feedback on our work. So let's talk about how to give an awesome presentation so you can start conversations. So today I'm going to review four main areas of giving scientific presentations. I'm going to start off with your professional persona, then talk about the content of your presentation, followed by visuals to aid your presentation, and finally delivery of your, of your presentation. So I intentionally start this presentation with a few tips about your professional persona. This matters if you are truly interested in using a presentation as a means for identifying collaborators, getting feedback, building your network, and the like, especially if you want to start talking and have conversations that are meaningful and going to move you and your work forward. So what is your professional persona? Well, your Professional persona is your personal branding in the workplace or workspace. In short, it's your professional identity. It's how you conduct yourself publicly when doing your work. Are you a fully engaged listener? Think about your nonverbal cues. Do you project confidence in what you know? And how well do you manage conflict? Those are only a few examples of activities that play into your personal your professional persona. It also is the image you project to coworkers defined broadly and others, and part of the image that you present during a presentation. So here are a few tips to be the best professional you. The goal is for you to refine and integrate this advice in a way that's right for you, that positions you to be true to your core values, to capitalize on your best unique traits, qualities, and inherent skills, and to improve upon those qualities that don't serve you well. You need to do this in your own way, according to your own timeline, and with the type and level of support and guidance that specifically works for you. Strong communication, listening, interpersonal skills, stress management, conflict negotiation, and many other skills are essential. But it is how you cultivate, combine, and put into practice and continually hone them in a professional context that con constitutes your unique professional identity and distinguishes you from others. So here are some examples of how you can do that in practice. Clarifying and staying true to your professional values. Don't sabotage yourself. You know what you know and project confidence in what you know. Be open to feedback, but do so in a way that's going to move the conversation forward. And lastly, ensuring that you look the part, especially with presentations, where unfortunately, whether we like it or not, books are still often judged by their, co by their covers. And so making sure that you're putting the best you forward is, is a good strategy to enhance your professional persona. When it comes to the content of your presentation, there are three main areas on which to focus. Audience, format, and the story. So one of the first and most important recommendations when preparing for any presentation is to know your audience. To whom will you be presenting? How can you find out more about your audience if you are unfamiliar? A recent piece in the conversation addressed what it means to know your audience when communicating about science. In this piece, Dr. John Vesley, who incidentally is a colleague of Dr. Friedman and mine from when he was at the University of South Carolina, he has now moved on to Michigan State, and Dr. Anthony Dudo identify a few tips uh, regarding this important recommendation, know your audience. For example, Knowing your audience can also mean that you pick your audience. In other words, if you are being strategic about how you are sharing your work, you actually select your audience. To which professional or scientific conference or meeting do I want to have this conversation? And you intentionally choose the one that fits best. And this is, of course, a most ideal scenario. But there are also times when you may be asked to present your work to audiences with whom you are less familiar. Ask whomever invited you. 
What does your audience think or feel is another tip. And lastly, you can't always know everything about your audience, which is why it's a good idea to get a general sense of who will comprise your audience, whether it be specialists, a subgroup of specialists, or non-specialists, so that you can effectively tailor your content to your audience. The format of your presentation matters in terms of how you will present the content. Will you be using a poster format? What are the dimensions? What is the standard format that's expected for this setting? Will you stand by your poster for the duration? Will there be judges circulating to ask you questions? These are all ways in which you can better prepare for the format of your presentation by understanding the context and circumstances. The same is true for poster slams, oral presentations, and a three-minute thesis presentation, which is a specific format in which a presenter has three minutes to convey the importance and meaning of your work to a non-specialist audience, which can be very challenging for those of us who have developed tremendous expertise in a particular area. These are all considerations for the format of your presentation. It matters because your content, which is based on your audience, also will be tailored to the format of your presentation. Speaking of content, how you tell the story of your work comprises the content. Your content should be based on the audience and format of your presentation. I like to work with an outline, and others recommend this approach as well. Lay out the major components of your work, such as the background, methods, results, discussion, and conclusion. Maybe add three bullets or so under each of those headings with the important pieces to share. And then identify Overall, what are the two to three most important pieces of information you want to convey? What do you want everyone to know and remember about your work? And this is a way to go back and revisit your outline and those major pieces of information you're sharing. Will you achieve this goal of conveying the two to three most important pieces of information you want everyone to know and remember? Most people, quite frankly, are very interested in your results and in putting your results in context. In fact, some journals now have reorganized the manuscript format, format to begin with a very brief introduction and going directly to the results and interpretation, and the methods get put at the end. This is not to diminish the incredible importance of the methods and the rigor of the methods, but the focus here is on what should I know about this work? What matters? The previous presenter talked about that question about, so what? What is the big picture take home? And you want to effectively convey that through your presentation. As researchers, we are often reluctant to share what we think of us and our work and only part of the story. I am particularly sensitive to this in my work in HPV vaccination, where there is an anti-vaccination movement that often cherry picks various elements of my work and the work of others in this space to use them to support against vaccination. But that's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying tell the story about your work in a way that's going to reinforce the two to three major points. And the content of your presentation should be based on the audience and the format and getting you to that point of sharing those important pieces of information. Next is visual. Um, let's see what happened here. I've broken the webinar. <laughs> I apologize. I actually used one moment. Yes, uh, the slide uh, slide was visuals is the slide I'm trying to get to. Oh, I see. Twenty four.
This is not part of giving an awesome presentation, in case any of you are wondering. <laughs> being, familiar, being familiar with the AV is very important, and I highly recommend that. And uh, I use this format all the time, so I'm terribly sorry that I just um, messed up the, the PowerPoint <laughs> trying to get to my next slide. I'll just keep going since we have a time um, limit here. So the next um, piece of my presentation is focused on visuals. Uh, and so ironically, we have no visuals in front of us at this moment. However, uh, your visuals, how your presentation looks, says a lot about you as a scholar. Have you ever heard the phrase sloppy visuals or sloppy appearance can mean sloppy science? Well, this is one that was instilled in me early in my training, and it is one that has remained with me over time. Your visuals are like a first impression of your work. You want to show people your work is done with rigor and is of high quality, and your visuals can contribute to that. So for visuals, simple is best. Great timing there. Simple is best. Uh, most importantly, you want to present your content without errors, making sure there are no typos, grammatical, or other errors for your audience. So here are a few tips about visuals. Use simple backgrounds. This matters for readability. And I know it's exciting to see all those fantastic options in PowerPoint or other software, but simple is best. For readability, a blue background, solid dark blue with yellow writing, is actually best for visual acuity. Another safe option is a white background with black text, like the one I'm using today. Make sure your font is large enough for your audience to read. Use standard fonts. There's no need to get cute. And never use Comic Sans for your presentation, please. Stick to the basics like Times New Roman, Arial, Calibri. Don't use more than two to three types of font. I stick to a serif font like Times New Roman, Cambria, or Garamond for headings, and a sans serif font like Arial or Calibri for text and body. Make sure to limit your use of color. Red text can seem very aggressive and even offensive in your presentation, and using a rainbow of colors is highly distracting. Use your color meaningfully. And as I've done today, make sure you brand your materials. The main color for the University of South Carolina is garnet, so I've used garnet accents. And tables and figures. Let's have a word about tables and figures. So tables and figures are very difficult to use in a presentation where you're using PowerPoint. A poster or some fixed format you may be able to use a wide range of tables and figures. They can be very hard to read, if not simplified, to reinforce the main takeaway point for the table or figure. Please do not put a table up that ends up being so small that you can't even read the words or the numbers, and then say, I know you can't read this, but. Well, instead of using it, give us the but give us the part about the table or figure that is incredibly important to support your presentation and the story that you're telling. All right, next I'm going to talk about um, the delivery, which is also an important part. And the last part of presentations I will address. So to get to this point, you have formulated the story of your work based on your audience format and content in a visually appealing format and delivery is just as important. You can have the best content, the best visuals, and your delivery may lack the same excellence. Practice is very important and can't be underestimated. So when it comes to um, delivery, it's making sure that you're timely, attentive, prepared, competent, professional, engaging, honest, and yourself. Um, in fact, you can use your social media to help promote the work that you're doing. Include your social media handles and information on materials to connect with audience members. Email your materials to yourself in advance, so if somebody asks for a copy of your presentation, hand them your, hand them your phone to type in their email and forward it to them immediately, and then you have a record of their email. 
have a microsite with a QR or a quick response code to scan and access immediately. And remember, if you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know. Even better, I don't know, but let me look into that and get back to you. Or that is a great question, but I do not have the answer right now. Can I get back to you? It's also okay to let someone know when something is beyond your scope of your work. So let's put it all together for an awesome presentation. For an awesome presentation, think of a concise, interesting title. So back to the previous presenter who said, begin with the end in mind. So let's assume you're going to have the opportunity to make the presentation. Make sure your title is, is tight and not overly long and is interesting. Cut down on text. Word counts of about 300 to 800 words for printed posters max. And for PowerPoint, make sure that you have enough white space. Tell a story and let your visuals breathe. Make sure you choose a color palette that's going to enhance what you're sharing or brand what you're sharing and not detract from it. Size matters, not only the size of the font, but the size of tables and figures. And don't go all crazy on those fonts either. As I said, don't ever use Comic Sans uh, as in a serious presentation. And refigure your figures to focus on what is most important. In addition to specific tips on content visuals and delivery, here are a final few tips. First, practice. As I noted in the section of the presentation on delivery, practice as much as you can. This means you cannot finish your slides the morning of a presentation if you are going to practice. And get feedback through practicing to refine and strengthen your presentation. It's also a great way to find collaborators and expand on your research program if you want someone who's less familiar with your work to give you feedback. Second, work with your colleagues and mentors several times throughout the presentation, including just a moment ago when discussing practice. Um, I also talk to colleagues and mentors. Whether you have given no presentations, one presentation, or more than 100 presentations, we all can benefit from the input of others about our work. And third, tell your story. Being able to tell your story depends on the story itself. How well have you framed the content of your story for your audience, the format, and made sure to emphasize take-home messages? How effective are your visuals to support your story and not detract from it? And then the telling, your delivery. Can you capture the attention of your audience? Can you convey the most important points? How can you use your presentation to start a conversation? I have a few references uh, that may be of interest to you related to uh, conference presentations or giving presentations to help you give an awesome scientific presentation. So I'm happy at the end to answer any questions. Thank you. And I'm pleased to turn things over to Jane, who's next. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Heather Brandt. Next up, please welcome Dr. Jane Moeller. Hi. Can you hear me all? It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And, um, and thank you very much for the two previous talks. I think, I think all of these talks will work very well together and are very relevant to um, career development. So, um, you know, career development is one of our passions here at the University of Arizona and one of mine in particular. And, um, and I, I hope that, um, whoops, let's see. We're having a hard time advancing. It's the more than a short delay. <laughs> Can you advance for us, uh, Gwen? Thank you. So um, I, I want to begin with the Mary Oliver quote. She's one of my favorite poets. And I think it's really important to think about, you know, who we want to be. And I, Jeff alluded to this earlier and, and how we want to get there and to really, um, so, so the purpose of career development um, planning is to really do this, is to really try to figure out these things and to begin um, 
and to you know uh, get focused. Um, okay, next. Okay. Um, so the objectives, just real briefly, are to talk about why planning is important, um, picking a generative environment and generative mentors, which is really critical to being successful, I think. Making the plan, re revisiting the plan, and then I'm, we're going to do a quick uh, review of an academic scholar career development plan that we use here at the University of Arizona and I found to be very helpful for academic scholars. Next slide. So why is planning important? We know that um, those who plan um, are more likely to achieve their goals, and this has been demonstrated in um, uh, many papers within the academic literature. Um, a directed planning process helps us to identify and stay focused on both our short-term goals and our long-term goals. And it helps our mentors um, to communicate the critical steps that we need to achieve um, and, you know, the skills we need to build, the content expertise we need to develop, and our leadership and development of our leadership strengths. And it helps our mentors hold our feet to the fire as well. Next slide. So it's really important to pick a generative environment and mentors. And I think this is something that, you know, oftentimes we sort of find ourselves in, a, in an environment or we pick, we pick a, a academic program or a lab or a, or an, um, a position um, as employees within, uh, you know, focusing on a lot of different issues. But we don't often think about, um, is this uh, environment going to create a really good career development environment for me? And am I, are they going to help me reach my goals or even surpass my goals? Um, so um, a generative mentor is super, super important. And we won't go into picking a mentor today, but um, it's a, a very important thing. And there's a wide literature um, on this process. Our mentors are often academic instructors or research or clinical supervisors. And, you know, sometimes there can be a conflict of interest interest for them and for us. What's best for them may not be what's best for us. Um, and so it's important to make sure that we pick a mentor that really has our best at heart. Um, um, over the years, many mentees have complained to me about being held back by being in restrictive settings, restrictive labs or clinical settings. For instance, they may not be able to publish papers or participate in abstracts or have their own internal projects. And it's really important that you're in, again, in a generative setting, um, which best supports your career development. So before you join a program, a lab, or a job, be sure to inquire about their commitment to career development by talking to people within that setting um, or, um, or looking at their, the literature that's been um, uh, published and seeing if they have younger folks on their papers. <laughs> That's an important thing because oftentimes there can be real restriction in terms of academic products. Um, and also make sure when you pick a mentor um, that, that they can really link you to opportunities because the more linkages they have nationally or internationally, the more they're going to be able to help you actually achieve what it is you plan to do. Next. So making the plan, um, most of you will be familiar with SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. If you're not familiar with this planning process, become familiar because it's very important. Um, and um, career development plans should always use SMART goals. We, we want to make sure that what you're targeting is specific and measurable and, and indeed is achievable. Next slide. So your career development plan should cover a logical period of time. Jeff talked earlier um, about the, the timeline, uh, uh, one particular timeline. I like to kind of think about one to three years, and that's because most of the, the mentees we have here are in academic programs, and that's sort of the timeline. PhDs can sort of be longer, certainly, and so that can be a longer career development plan. So it really depends on your circumstance, how long you intend to be in a place. Um, 
the career development plan should be reviewed quarterly by you to make sure, you know, am I, am I, you know, really achieving what it is that I'm purporting to achieve? Where am I falling short? What do I need to, to do to kind of fix this? And um, we need to take a constant, a constant iterative approach to really um, improve our career development plan and change it to make sure that we're aimed in the direction that we indeed want to go. Further, um, the plan should be updated annually. Next slide. So there's no perfect plan um, uh, that's ideal for everyone or every setting. Um, there are many online you can select from depending on where you are in your career trajectory. Um, they should guide the appropriate path, which given, uh, given the circumstances. Um, so what I'd like to do is to review a plan that we've used at the University of Arizona for a while. We kind of developed this years ago and have tweaked it. Um, and um, we use it for, you know, we change it based on the mentee that's being um, mentored. Um, but it is basically focused um, for academic career development planning, so it should be relevant to most of you. And we'll take the next few minutes just to quickly review it and go over what should be in this career development plan. Um, a really important thing to begin with is career, your career goal. What do you want to do? And dream big. This is not just a one year or three year timeline. This is like, what do you want to be when someone says, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and make it again, incorporate those smart um, uh, goals. Um, and an example is becoming an independent investigator in cognitive aging and fMRI with the abilities to successfully gain funding and to demonstrate the impact of my work nationally and internationally. Um, you could add to that to be a, you know, a tenured professor within an academic healthcare setting. Um, but really get specific. What are you dreaming about? Um, Three-year goal, um, what are you gonna do in the three-year timeline? Maybe complete a PhD in cognitive science with an emphasis on imaging. Um, but again, get as specific as possible. Um, in terms of activities, um, we, we like to specify both the specifics of how it's going to be done and completion dates, okay? It's nice to check off those things that you've done. Um, courses and lectures, grand rounds, remote training, independent skills to be gained. All those things uh, need to be addressed. Um, skills in terms of academic products are very important. Um, as the two previous um, uh, talks talked about, um, so, so uh, it's important to have literature review skills. And these are some specific examples that, um, that uh, you know, using EndNote or RefWorks, uh, meeting with the research librarian or doing online tutorials. and. Prisma uh, site review, which is how to do a, a systematic, how to perform a systematic review, participating in completion of, of a review and reading systematic reviews um, so that you really understand what they are. Um, city training and IRB processes. So this is, I don't know how many of you have completed your um, human um, subject um, training but all of you should be certified in this before you finish your training. We use REDCap um, as a database here, um, and many uh, academic uh, centers do as well. Um, it's important to get trained in databases and how to do data entry um, and assure data quality. Training ex and experience is important. Um, content and aging research or content and, um, and cognition research or content in whatever area of research you intend to um, um, develop your expertise is important in specifying what that content expertise will be, at, get, how it will be gained. Um, in terms of training and shadowing, clinical sh shadowing, having your mentor hook you up with different um, clinicians, different uh, clinical settings, um, performing a research, uh, clinical research project um, is important. Um, you know, really knowing how to um, observe the consent process or perform the consent process and, um, you know, all the things that are involved in clinical research, collecting the data, um, communication. 
Um, also becoming familiar with community support organizations in your area is important and, and meeting people to expand your um, web. Finally, um, making sure that you are planning on your academic products. Um, so performing a literature review um, in EndNote or RefWorks um, is, a, is a really good thing. Um, drafting and submitting an abstract, delivering a lecture or two um, is important. Um, uh, uh, making health education project, uh, products, um, if that is within your realm, is an important thing. You know, really knowing how to develop those or at least participating in a team that develops health education products and really learning how to do that. Um, learning how to evaluate um, and then attending conferences and presenting um, your work is exceedingly important and they can be intramural just local um, conferences where you are presenting to your to your um, colleagues or it can be national or international conferences so this is just a quick and dirty um, uh, kind of guide to really assuring that you'll be able to develop your academic um, uh, career. Um, so I, I think um, that's about all I have. I'm happy to discuss further when we um, all talk together in a question. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Jeff Harris, Dr. Heather Brandt, and Dr. Jane Moeller. And now we would like to open up with Q&A um, with our presenters. So please submit your questions in the chat box if you have not already. Um, I do have one question for Dr. Heather Brandt. And it's about the outlines. A person had asked, do others work with outlines too? So this is Jeff. I, I'm a big believer in outlines. I think it's, it, uh, it's that thing of begin, that begin with the end in mind. And if you're trying to do a presentation or trying to prepare a paper or trying to write a grant, um, I loved her point of uh, boiling things down to two or three things. Even most grants can be boiled down to two or three things. And, and an outline just helps you kind of collect your thoughts before you start writing. It can save you so much time. It's, it's terrible to, you know, write pages that you then throw out later. And you can avoid that with outlines. Yeah, and this is, this is Jane. And I, I totally agree. Um, I see time and time again students come in and they're, they're trying to write a paper and they'll just launch into it without an outline and it has to be completely thrown out. And um, yeah, it's very sad to waste that time and energy. Excellent, excellent. So um, speakers and presenters, if you have any comments or questions for each other, you feel free to um, discuss as well. <clears throat> Just want to give everyone room to say any last things um, on their mind. Um. This is Heather. So I think that you picked a great group uh, of topics for us to uh, present on because I think there's a lot of alignment between mm -hmm. them. So mentors can help us with time management. They also can help us with developing and, and sharing our story about our work in compelling and powerful ways. And I think conversely, being an effective time manager is going to help us as mentors ourselves, you know, help us learn how to guide um, the people for whom we're, we're offering mentoring advice or teaching, whether it's in the classroom or outside, and as well as the tips that I provided on presentations. I think freshening up a presentation style for people who've been doing it for a long time can be something maybe that is, is not high on the priority list to borrow one of Jeff's uh, ways to organize time, but I think it does pay off in the long run. Um, I think part of the reason why in public health we have a chance to be effective and have shown effectiveness and impact in our work 
is because of our ability to tell the story. And being an effective storyteller, I think, only raises the work of the network and of each of you as scholars as well. Okay. Dr. Brandt, do you, what do you think about starting a presentation um, with key messages? And this is also for Dr. Harris and Dr. Moeller as well. What do you all think about starting a presentation with key messages? I think key messages are a great way to get the attention of the audience and then provide additional sources of evidence or additional rationale leading up to each of those key messages. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I know of a couple of journals where you give a paragraph, a very brief paragraph, introduction, and then dive right into the results and your interpretation of those results. And I think it's an interesting way. Um, it is what people want to know about your work. So I think there are several ways in which you can convey those two to three main take home points in your presentation. Okay. Yeah, I, this is uh, Jane. I think it's uh, sometimes works well to begin with a question and which, which, which kind of poses what the problem is and you know, engages people because people you know, tend to care about, you know, you're, you're trying to get them to care about what you're going to talk about. Um, and if you can sort of do that, um, it really helps to engage them initially. Okay, okay. And are there any other strategies about handling the qu quantity of emails mm -hmm. received by PIs? Well, sure, I've got three briefly. One would be to if at all possible, touch email, each email only once. And so, <clears throat> you know, I just keep a big archive folder because uh, search works pretty well on email these days. I wish it worked better, but I'll either, uh, when I look at an email, I'll either deal with it right away or I will uh, put it, you know, whatever it is I need to do with that email on my to-do list and then I'll save it in the archive and, you know, or I'll delete it. Um, second thing would be emailing uh, setting up just a couple of times a day to email so that it's not constantly nagging at you and constantly distracting you and keep you keeping you from doing other things. So, you know, maybe once in the morning and once in the in the middle of the day or and maybe once in the evening. But but just to, you know, limit the amount of times you actually dip into email. And the third is that the truism that's quite true is the more you email people, the more you have emails to respond to. And so one thing is to not reply all. I mean, sometimes there, sometimes it's appropriate to reply all, but if you're thoughtful about whom you reply to, then you say even bounce backs. I mean, who needs the bounce backs? You know, I'm on vacation. Well, I didn't really even want to reply to you. So just, you know, don't, um, don't reply all if you can avoid it and you'll save uh, quite a bit of time on email. Okay. Yeah, I have an this, Heather, I want to echo that. It is, it is so inefficient when what you have to say doesn't matter for the whole group. Just follow up with the sender if it's necessary, but always think twice before you send emails because I can attest, as we all can, uh, sending emails gets emails and only send it if it's absolutely necessary and never reply all unless what you have to say is of great value to everyone who's going to receive the email. Mm -hmm. This is Jane. Yeah, I, I think too is be very careful about um, joining your personal emails to your professional emails because then you have double the amount of emails to go through um, and, you know, many of which will not be relevant to your work um, setting and may be distracting. And so if you can have, you know, if you can split out your email, that, that's the best strategy. It's not always easy easily done, but um, it will really help with the timing. Okay. And then what presentation venues would you recommend for students who may not have the opportunity to go to national conferences quite yet to get comfortable with some of the awesome scientific presentations tips that were shared? So are there any presentation venues that you would recommend presenters for students? Mm -hmm. Almost every academic setting has has multiple conferences, you know, both within departments, colleges of medicine, colleges of public health, different, you know, at least multiple times a year. So 
um, having a list of those opportunities and then really trying to get in front of, um, uh, you know, within those conference uh, as, as much as possible to give you the experience that you need. And also your internal lab, I think, can be very helpful in terms of getting the feedback as was alluded to earlier. Mm, okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, works in progress seminars are a great opportunity for graduate students. I love our state public health association conference. It's small scale, it's not expensive. The stakes are lower. It's a great place for, for people starting their career to go and present. And yet you get good feedback there and there are people who actually can use it tomorrow, so. Okay, okay. good to know. Yeah, and I would say another uh, tip is depending on how comfortable you are, you can also, use WordPress blogs or other blog uh, platforms to share information about your work. You can use other social media platforms to share infographics to stimulate and attract interest, especially on academic Twitter, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so those are different types of formats, non-traditional in a sense, but technology has afforded us many tools to be able to share our work and disseminate our work more globally. And so taking advantage of those and learning how to do that effectively may also be another strategy. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, very, very great answers. And my last two questions are how not to panic when the week planning didn't go as planned. And is there any strategy not to fall into the trap of underestimating the time needed to complete the task? Well, sure. I mean, uh, my days rarely go as planned. Uh, so you can imagine my weeks don't go as planned and certainly my six months don't go as planned and my life doesn't go as planned. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's the way it goes. But I think if you don't have a plan, then you're certainly not going to get to where you want to go. I see. So it's, I, you know, I think you have to roll with the punches. The second question, is there any strategy to not fall into the trap of underestimating time? So I do estimate time. I didn't mention that as one thing because I only could do, I only had 10 slides. I do try to estimate how much time I will spend on things and, I'm, and I've gotten better at it uh, okay. by doing it. And I suggest that you do that. But another strategy is if you say, I'm gonna just work on this paper or this presentation or this grant for 30 minutes today and you set a timer on your phone, then you, you really can keep it to 30 minutes because you know your, the alarm goes off, the timer goes off and you stop. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. Very true. Well, I definitely appreciated all of the information I received today on time management, giving presentations, and I still have the jitters when I stand and present. So listening to um, Dr. Brandt just break it down as though I'm telling a story is really helpful. And also having a lot of mentors is also helpful in career navigation as I found moving from Florida to Portland, Oregon. Um, so I am really, really grateful. And I thank you again, um, Dr. Jeff Harris, Dr. Heather Brandt, and Dr. Jane Moeller for your time. And participants, please complete our post-webinar uh, evaluation. Remember that your input is valuable. And finally, we'd like to thank you sponsors. And this webinar would not have been possible without the support of the CDC Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program and the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Any last comments? Anyone? You know, I'll make one last comment just to support Heather I, about practice. I practice every talk I give three times out loud, and it's made such a huge difference, and those jitters go away. Mm, okay. I have to practice more. <laughs> three times. It's not more. Three times. Three times. Okay. Out loud. In a mirror. Okay. And then to your colleagues. <laughs> yeah. So practice three times in the mirror and then to my colleagues again three times. Wow. <laughs> Those jitters will fly away. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I mean, you also can use your iPhone or use your smartphone or use your webcam and record yourself and share it that way. So if somebody can't hear you or see you present live, they can watch a recording of you and get a sense of uh, how you might improve or make recommendations. And you can do that for yourself too. Okay. Great idea.
Well, I look forward to all your awesome presentations in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, thank you so much again for your time. Um, we're right up about 930. So um, if there's any other comments, please feel free to share them in the chat box. Otherwise, please have a great day and an awesome week.